It's a story that captured headlines for weeks. The kidnap and brutal killing of eight-year-old Tori Stafford in 2009. Less well-known is the story of one of her killers, Terry Lynn McClintock, who's now serving a life sentence in a Kitchener jail. What could lead an 18-year-old to commit such a monstrous crime? Tonight, in a 16 by 9 exclusive, we hear for the first time from Terry Lynn's family, and we take a closer look at a life that went so horribly wrong. What you're witnessing is an abduction. 11 seconds is all it took for a stranger to lure away eight-year-old Tori Stafford and forever change the lives of so many in Woodstock, Ontario. You gotta get sick to your boots, sir. There's discussion, like, per previous to the, the day of the event, with Mike saying, oh, would you ever, you know, would you ever kidnap somebody? You can well, well, through a whole thing where, oh, you're, you're just talk, you never do it, you're just talk. So you're, gonna do, you're gonna do that today, you're gonna do that today. April 8th, 2009 was that day. Victoria was the, pretty much the first um, young, like younger female that came out. Quickly, they were off school property and into her boyfriend's car. Not since Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka have Canadians faced such heinous crimes or more disturbed killers. You tell her you get a girl and you are young. She walks up to Tori. Tori's nice to her. She trusts her. She holds her hand for a little bit. Terry Lynn tells her about her little dog, gets her across the street to your car, opens the back door. Tori doesn't like it anymore. She pushes you in the car. You start driving. Tori was last seen in Woodstock at 3.30 Wednesday afternoon. Hundreds of community residents have been working around the clock, helping in the search for Tori. If I knew, like, what what the outcome of that would have been, I never would have. Terry Lynn McClintock and Michael Rafferty, both convicted of the first-degree murder of Tori Stafford. It took just hours to destroy the innocence of a little girl, her family, and an entire town. It was a complete regular morning. For Tara McDonald, eight-year-old Victoria Stafford's mother, that regular morning is seared in her memory. It was weird because it was one morning where she didn't fight, she didn't... She wasn't fussy, she wasn't cranky. Her clothes had been laid out the night before. She got up, She. I put a little bit of lip gloss on her. I lent her my headband, my butterfly earrings. She was dressed and ready to go on time. Tara sent Tori to school, not knowing this would be the last time she'd see her daughter alive. Woodstock, Ontario is home to 38,000 people, the kind of blue-collar town where people feel safe letting their children walk home from school. Tori lived just a few blocks away from her school with her mother, big brother Darren, and stepdad James. But life wasn't perfect. I was going to the methadone clinic, I was trying to get clean, I was trying to get my life together. Tori's parents were separated. Her father, Rodney Stafford, had visitation rights, but hadn't seen Tori for six months prior to her disappearance. Whenever I'd see her, she always had that one huge daddy and come running and give me a big hug, no matter what had gone on, right? Um, she was always happy to see me. Part tomboy, part diva, Tori was a precocious child. Smart, strong-willed, the kind of kid it was hard to believe could ever be lured away. She was a, a spunky, funky. One minute she'd be wearing a dress with pantyhose and her tappy shoes, and she was all dressed up with her hair dead and everything, and she'd be outside digging up worms and bugs. Tori usually walked home from school with her brother, but on this day, someone else was waiting. He uh, had made the comment about young female, so it'd be easy to manipulate. It was 3.32 in the afternoon. School had just let out. 
She was famous for when we lived three doors up from the school. She wouldn't get home until quarter to four, four o'clock because she'd play around with her friends in the yard. There were reports that Tara had been high on Oxycontin when Tori was supposed to be coming home from school that day. No. That's not the case. I wasn't high on drugs. I wasn't... I wasn't out of my mind laying on the couch out of it. I was waiting for my kids to come home. I wasn't high. When that wait was too long, too much time had passed, Tara started a search of the neighborhood, family, and friends. Tori's grandmother officially reported her missing to Woodstock police at 6.04 p.m. It was 20 after 8 when I got the message, and I remember having a very uneasy feeling, and I, I, I expressed to my wife that this one's different, there's something wrong here. He start driving. She says she's freaking out. She says she's worried about you. She's scared about what you're going to do. By the time Rafferty hit Highway 401, McClintock was keeping Tory crouched on the floor of the back seat, out of the view of passing vehicles. They headed east towards Guelph, Ontario. Rafferty even had the forethought to take his battery out of his cell phone, knowing he couldn't be tracked. He listened to the radio for any reports of a missing girl. There was nothing. Many questioned why police didn't issue an Amber Alert. Woodstock Chief of Police Rod Freeman says they couldn't issue the alert without a go-ahead from the Ontario Provincial Police. My inspector of operations, he contacted the OPP twice to ask if we could engage the Amber Alert system. The OPP said no? That's right, they said no. With no one on their trail, the pair made three stops before the final crime scene. First, Tim Hortons. Rafferty went in, McClintock stayed with Tory, but ordered a tea for the trip. Second, Michael Rafferty stopped to buy pills, Percocets. Then, with Tory still crouched in the back, they drove to Home Depot to pick up tools. He wanted, he wanted a claw hammer, a garbage bag, garbage bags, like a box of garbage bags. Surveillance video showed McClintock leisurely shopping in the store, scanning the garbage bags herself, along with the claw hammer that would soon deliver Tori's final blow. I was really contemplating like, whether or not I wanted to go back up to the vehicle or not. Um, my biggest reason for even going back to the vehicle was because Tori was there, and I knew at least while I was there, I could, I could, I could at least make it somewhat better for her. McClintock sobs through her interrogation. But when the officer leaves to get her a Kleenex, her sobs stop. She returns to her coffee, wiping her eyes just as she hears the officer coming back in. In a six-hour, 15-minute interrogation, McClintock breaks down multiple times, crying, saying she's sorry. And yet, despite three stops, three chances to flag help, three chances to escape with Tori, Terry Lynn McClintock does nothing except go along with Michael Rafferty's abduction of an innocent eight-year-old girl. You go driving, and you pull into a farmer's field, right across from a house, to the point where you're even asking her if anybody can see you. And what does she do? She says she goes for a walk she doesn't want to see what happens and then she goes back and you're not sitting in the front seat anymore Mike you're sitting in the back seat and she's not liking what she sees so she walks away again over the next hour the abduction turns to rape and murder by the time the search for eight-year-old Tori Stafford was underway in Woodstock Ontario it was too late the police searched for five days straight there were vigils and marches, all the while Tori's body lay two hours away in a farmer's field. When Victoria was taken, she was brutally sexually assaulted and killed uh, within hours. And the investigation was really ramping up at, at 8 p.m. 
Well, we now know that our, our two uh, convicted killers were back in the city by that point. The, the act had been done. Days and weeks passed with no answers, no real leads. Where was Tori? For three months straight, it was look around every corner, look through every window, look through every car, look like look in every ditch. The entire time that she was missing, I would not allow myself to think that she wasn't coming home. I, I couldn't. Questions began to surface about Tara's drug use and rumors perhaps Tori's abduction was a drug debt or even revenge. With no other clues, Tara became the primary suspect. Why was I concentrated on so hard for so long? Four days after the surveillance video was released showing Tori being lured away, a friend of Tara's recognized the woman in the video as Terry Lynn McClintick. I called the police on April the 12th and said that is Terry Lynn McClintick in that video. Tara recognized her because she had met McClintic before. She says she bought Oxycontin pills from McClintic or Carol at their home. Finally, 102 days after Tori's disappearance, 101 days since surveillance video revealed Tori being led away by a woman, Tori's remains were discovered. Right up till the time they had found her remains, I still believe she was still, she was alive. Tori's confirmed death was the beginning of a whole new kind of torture. Now her family faced the disturbing question, what really happened to their eight-year-old girl? Who were the people responsible? How could anyone do that to a child? The Crown Attorney had taken us in and showed us, shown us the uh, post-mortem photos. And as, as morbid as it sounded, I had to see the pictures. To me, we had buried a box until we saw those photos. And then it was a reality that, no, Tori's in there. But when it came out in the courtroom, I, I couldn't watch it again. I couldn't. Because it made me relive. Any of the parts that made me relive the last three hours of, of her life just make me more and more angry. Because it's three hours of her being scared three hours of not knowing what was said to her what was done to her what was all we know is during the course of the last three hours of her life she was abducted brutally beaten raped tortured when they told me that it was terry lynn mcclintock and michael rafferty that had been charged i was surprised and i was angered because i had told them four days after tori went missing that that's who that was the hazy figure in the surveillance video finally identified as 18-year-old Terry Lynn McClintock confessed during a police interrogation that she and 28-year-old Michael Rafferty abducted and murdered 8-year-old Victoria Elizabeth Stafford. Next on 16 by 9, loss of innocence from Kid. I remember the... the... The sweet little three-year-old Terry Lynn, who used to run around the house. To kill her. A murderous duo, Michael Rafferty and Terry Lynn McClintock. Together, they abducted, raped, and murdered an eight-year-old girl. The country was spellbound and horrified to learn who the killers were. 28-year-old Michael Rafferty was considered the mastermind at the time, a man with a history of choking women during sex, and hundreds of files that included child pornography were found on the computer in his home. Terry's a liar. Yeah. Terry Lynn McClintock has been discovered to be much more than just a liar. At 18, she'd already committed many violent crimes and now is guilty of executing the abduction and facilitating Tori Stafford's rape. Any notion she was a follower was blown away as to being the one who actually wielded the hammer that killed Tori. It was me that committed the murder and not him. He didn't physically kill her. It wasn't him that killed her. It was me. 
A deeper look into Terry Lynn McClintock's life, into her past, reveals clues to how this teenager turned into a killer. Terry Lynn was born in 1990 in Woodstock, Ontario. Her mother, a stripper, didn't want the baby and gave her away to another stripper named Carol McClintock. Carol was raised, according to half-sister Adele Cowton, by an abusive father. Totally abused by her father from the time she was three years old when he took her. Physically, emotionally, and I believe sexually. I believe sexually because he did all those things to my sister and I. This wasn't Carol McClintock's first shot at motherhood. In fact, she would tried and failed to be a fit parent twice prior to receiving Terry Lynn. 16 by 9 tracked down Carol McClintock's biological children, and for the first time, they're speaking publicly. 11 years after she lost me, she was allowed to adopt a little baby girl. And how for the life of me that was able to happen, I don't know. They're not Terry Lynn's blood, but both consider themselves her siblings. Both agreed to talk to us on the condition of anonymity. They remember what life with Carol McClintock was like. You never knew what you would say that would set her off. She drank a lot. She, she would fly off the handle for little to no reason. She had a lot of boyfriends. Um, she didn't stay in one place for a long period of time. Carol was deemed unfit, and both her biological children were removed from her care. Adele Cowton took over and raised Carol's son. She says despite the fact that Carol wasn't fit to raise her biological children, she was able to adopt Terry Lynn. She says Terry Lynn's life with Carol was wrought with mental, physical, and sexual abuse, but no one stepped in to take the child away. Carol <sighs> moved in with this man in town. <gasps> oh my God, a monster. You never saw a monster like this man. The family says they warned the Children's Aid Society that Terry Lynn was in danger. When Carol was trying to get custody of her, I called the Children's Aid in Woodstock. I, and I tried to advise them. She lost two children. She should not be allowed to adopt this child. She's not stable enough. We felt that they, did, they just turned a deaf ear to us. I remember the, the, the sweet little three-year-old Terry Lynn who used to run around the house. He says he witnessed his little sister's innocence gradually disappear, altered by 18 years of mental, physical, and sexual abuse. There was no, there was no parenting. There was no, you know, I'm mom. This is, you know, this is my role, or this is your role, or, you know, this is, there, there was none of that. A lack of parenting often leaves a trail of tragic consequences, according to Dr. Marshall Korenblum. He's a child psychiatrist at Toronto's Hinks Delcrest Center. He says, couple a devious mother with severe abuse, and you've got what can be the makings of a monster. No question that physical and sexual abuse has uh, a very direct physical impact on the brain and, of course, a psycholog psychological impact on the mind. Terry Lynn's half-sister says her mother was an alcoholic and drug addict and got Terry Lynn involved in that lifestyle. Well, she was shooting oxys um, and, and perks. With her mother? Yes. And Terry Lynn claimed she was raped by men her mother would bring home. It's a maxim in child psychiatry that abuse begets abuse. So when a child has been mistreated, maltreated, neglected, uh, we know from studies that the risk of them becoming an abusing parent is elevated many, many, many times. As a young child, Terry Lynn began showing signs of an extremely troubled personality. She admitted in court to microwaving her dog until it screamed. You're taught in psychiatry that there are a couple of red flags or markers for future uh, violence towards people, and one of them is cruelty to animals. By 16 years old, her family says Terry Lynn was completely out of control. She was doing a lot of drugs. The scars of Terry Lynn's childhood are visible in her confessions with police. He said, well, obviously, obviously I'm gonna um, and it's a pretty big trigger for me to experience that in my own childhood. She recounts herself going through what she allowed Tori to endure at the hands of Michael Rafferty. Like I, I can hear, hear Tori crying. You hear that? I just like I just want to know. I didn't want to hear that.
past it stopped. According to Dr. Korenblum, it's not entirely surprising that Terry Lynn didn't step in to save Tori. If your brain is not wired properly, you won't be able to either recognize or respond to the feelings of others. So if you're born to a drug abusing mom, your brain is, is faulty. Now faced with the magnitude of the crimes Terry Lynn has committed, family members wonder what could have been done to stop her from taking the path to murder. I'm feeling so much guilt that I didn't do more. Had I been more involved in her life, maybe she wouldn't have done this. It bothers me that, that somebody could, could grow up in, in that kind of household and, and nobody did anything. Next on 16 by 9, no room for redemption. He and she are both exactly where they deserve to be for the rest of their lives. How did Terry Lynn Mc an ordinary kid, to a teenage killer? Her family says there were red flags along the way. Red flags they say authorities ignore. I've been kind of upset, but now that this has happened, I'm even more um, upset with how can the system fail her? You are devalued, demeaned, criticized, physically abused, maybe sexually abused. How do you develop a sense of self? I knew how that environment could be, and I didn't want her to be in it. But despite her troubled past, Terry Lynn's terrible choices robbed this little girl of a future, something Tori Stafford's mother, Tara, can never understand or accept. Give me a break. Yeah, you had a crappy life. Yeah, you've been raised by a drug addict, a, a, you know, whatever. You've lived in group homes and been... It doesn't excuse your behavior at all. It's been five months since the verdict, guilty on all counts. The people who killed Tara McDonald's daughter, Tori Stafford, are in jail, serving a life sentence. But the road forward hasn't been easy. I kind of thought that after the trial, not that everything would go away, but that maybe we would find peace or comfort, and that really hasn't happened yet. I get anxiety about going out. Like, it sounds crazy, but just to go out to Walmart. Everybody knows you're Tori Stafford's mom. People stare at you. People whisper. You hear, oh, that's Tori Stafford. Hi. Hi. Tara? Yeah. Great to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Have a seat wherever you're comfortable. Thanks. The overriding theme for the last three years has been Tori's death. Now her family wants Tori's life to be what's remembered. Tori's mother, Tara McDonald, wants her immortalized for the girl she was, not the victim she became. Like a guardian angel, she's getting Tori's face sketched in ink on her shoulder. So just take me a few minutes to drop the stencil. Tattooed on her body for life. Can you forgive them? Never, ever, ever, ever. That's something a lot of people have asked me, and it'll never happen. They have ruined not only my life, my son's life, took my daughter's life. They have ruined so many people's lives, and I can never, ever forgive them for that. Never. McClintock's family makes no excuse for Terry Lynn's crimes, despite her horrid past. But the woman who escaped the same upbringing has found a way to forgive Terry Lynn. I consider you my sister, even though we're not blood, we're not step, we're not half, we're not anything. You're my sister. McClintock is now here at this maximum security prison in Kitchener, Ontario. Despite working on finishing her high school education and getting counseling, it hasn't stopped the violent behavior. Already, she's severely beaten another inmate here just for rumors she was talking behind her back. Michael Rafferty is appealing his conviction, but Woodstock's chief of police, Rod Freeman, says it won't change anything. He and she 
are both exactly where they deserve to be for the rest of their lives. And, uh, you know, personally, um, I quite frankly hope they die in prison. And quite frankly, after that, they can burn in hell. Um, because what they did to an eight-year-old innocent child is, is unforgivable. Tori's death has driven change for Tara. She's been clean for one year, off oxys, even out of her methadone program. She's emerged sadder, but smarter. I used to watch stories like this on the news and think, you know, that would never happen in Woodstock. That would never happen here. That would never happen to me. And it did. Okay, we're all finished. Oh my God, Amy. That is incredible. The blue is perfect. Tara wanted just Tori's eyes to remain in color. They're what stood out in every picture, every missing child poster. The blue eyes were Tori's signature. It's amazing, like amazing. Gone, but always with her. And that is our broadcast for tonight. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, 